Friends, welcome to the Oxfordshire Community Hub, which has been set up by the Oxford Foundation to create a virtual Oxfordshire community to share stories, poems, music, song, art, um, anything really, as long as it's respectful towards others. So I want to give a very warm welcome to our guest today, uh, to Penny Faust, who is the co-president of the Oxford Jewish Congregation. Penny, welcome. Uh, to, to Oxfordshire Community Hub, and I hear that you've had a disagreement with a tree. Yeah, and I think the tree won, <laughs> unfortunately. I ended up with a black eye and a cut on my forehead, but I promise you it wasn't anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me, um, what does your role as co-president uh, of the Oxford uh, Jewish Congregation involve? Well, basically, um, we have a new president every two years, and usually it's just one person. But this year, as it happened, um, the, the, there wasn't anybody at the particular time that was able to take it on. So three of us who are ex-presidents took it, uh, decided that maybe we'd have a go at running it together. And uh, we all are saying how wonderful that this year of all times, it isn't the fact that it's only one person is in a sense being the face of the congregation and making sure that all the things that normally go on in the congregation can still go on. Now obviously at this particular time they're going on in a different way but we're trying very hard to maintain contact with all our members and uh, put, set up within the uh, congregational website different activities and we've got a phone tree and lots of other things which perhaps we can go into more detail about later just to make sure that we stay feeling that we are a community a community of jews mm, mm, oh, thank you and what size is the um, is, is the local jewish community and well we've got um about 134 families and 157 single units which makes in total somewhere around 420 adult members. Right. And in terms of diversity, um, and this leads me on to diversity of the, the, the local Jewish community, but also the uniqueness of the synagogue. So tell us a bit about that, please. Well, we think, we know we're the only congregation in Great Britain that incorporates all the normal denominations that exist within Judaism. In normal circumstances, if you went into a synagogue anywhere in the country, they would be either Orthodox, which is the most traditional, or Reform, or Liberal, now, or something called Mazalti. Now, the Liberals, uh, the Orthodox have their services in Hebrew, and they sit men and women apart, and rabbis are men. The Liberals, men and women, sit together. They have most, much of their service in English. They've changed the liturgy to a certain extent. They've brought it up to date. And they um, basically are very egalitarian. The Reform are more traditional in their worship. But again, they have men and women, uh, as the Liberals do, rabbis. And uh, they sit more towards the Liberals than the Orthodox. Mazorti is relatively new. It's based on American conservatism. All our services are in Hebrew, but again, we have men and women sitting together and we have women rabbis. So, uh, as I say, it's a bit like putting the Church of England, the Roman Catholics, the Baptists and the Methodists all under one roof and saying, right, folks, you've got to <laughs> share and you've got to respect each other. I'm not saying that people don't respect each other in those denominations, but it's been, it's something that grew organically out of our community. Um, it, we'd had people come here because they were evacuated during the war. Some of the liberals stayed on. It was an Orthodox congregation at the time. And then they wanted to have their own services. And we all had always mixed together socially and we, none of us wanted to lose that. We didn't want to have different synagogues. And we thought, all right, we're building a new building. This was at the end of the 60s. Let's give it a whirl. Let's see how long we managed to stay together. And it hasn't always been easy, but with respect and tolerance and 
uh, I guess putting the congregation above all other spiritual needs, we've managed it so far. And that's the way we hope to stay. Wonderful. It can only happen in Oxford. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think that's probably true. We also have a, a not just diversity of denomination, we have diversity of membership too, because it ranges fully from naught to 90 plus. And uh, uh, because Oxford attracts people in from all over the world, we have a diversity of nationality and we have people who are not religious at all and come to the synagogue only because we have a, a synagogue and Jewish center. They come only for social or cultural um, occasions. And we have people who keep as much as possible um, within the law. So there's, there's, there's a great, and, and I would say we have a huge diversity in terms of actual participation and commitment to community. But it's a great community to be part of because we don't make any distinction between any of the different reasons for coming to the synagogue and Jewish centre. Well, I know I've, I've been in the synagogue many times and it's always wonderful visiting and uh, I've made some great friends and it's always a lovely and welcoming atmosphere. Um, currently, Penny, with, with, with this, um, you know, the ban on place of the worship and so on, I just wonder whether you could touch on um you know in terms of services we can't have physical services but but what are you doing in terms of keeping in touch with the with, with the jewish community well we're keeping in touch with them in various ways we started off with thinking about the people who perhaps were most vulnerable because they were on their own or because they were older and we set up a phone tree in order to make sure that everybody got a phone call or an email and in the case of, of the person i'm dealing with um, a very old friend but she's become increasingly deaf and she said to me penny can we communicate by email rather than by phone because otherwise i struggle to find out what you're going to say mm. so what we're trying to do is make to make sure that those people those vulnerable people are supported um, we also have gone to the other end and the what we call play show, which happens at the same time as Sunday morning uh, classes, um, religious classes for, the, for all the children in the congregation. Play show deals with the children before they go to school. And we recognize that they, most of the parents get a lot of support from their interaction with other parents with that kind of age group. So I gather this morning they had a Zoom meeting of play show, which was everybody seemed to enjoy enormously and we will be as we go on uh, we, we don't have a huge amount of capacity in the congregation uh, but we hope to set up other groups too now that creates difficulty there are there are religious services being being streamed from all over the country you can find them on the web um, it creates difficulties on the Sabbath for those who are Orthodox because they don't use technology on the Sabbath. But there are other services during the week that people can join. And we are thinking now as a congregation how we can involve, put, try and get something together actually within the congregation. So as much as we can do, we will do, but always staying because we have a respect for the different traditions. We always want to stay within the tradition. It, it, obviously, if you're Orthodox, you're not going to be looking for a stream service on the Sabbath, and that's going to leave you somewhat spiritually bereft. Mm. But you will be able to join Orthodox services which happen every day um, through other Orthodox congregations, which you can find on the um, congregation website. You can find the access, the means of access. So we hope to be able to help and we also have two other particular organizations we we're very lucky that about eight ten years ago we set up an organization called helping hands which runs all the time but that has a list of volunteers which has grown enormously since this uh, since we put out a call for volunteers who have been prepared to do shopping to take people to the hospital to support people physically in any way that we can and as I say, that organization has grown enormously since the virus started. Obviously, they can't do as much in physical terms as they were able to before, but they can do shopping by taking a text or an email and then leaving it on the doorstep and people leaving money on the doorstep. And that's going on continuously. 
And we also have a counselling organisation. So that's there to provide, and they are all trained. The people who work for that are all trained in some form of counselling. So they also can be supportive to people. And I guess um, the fact that they were there already has meant that we've been able to build on it. Great, thank you. And I know, uh, I mean, you know, we've known each other for a very long time and you've always been involved in interfaith work and you were one of the founding members of the Oxford Council of Faiths. And, and I just wonder uh, your reflections and thoughts on how, how important is our interfaith relationships and why do you feel that they're, they're important? I think they're important because in a time when, and it, it's not just now, it's, it, we tend to look back at the past and think, oh, that was very rosy, but it wasn't very rosy. I was at a church school and I encountered a, quite a considerable amount of anti-Semitism and a, lot, a, a lack of knowledge about what Judaism really meant. And I started off my interfaith work, even at university, um, being part of the Council of Christians and Jews and talking to Christians about what Judaism was really about and not as how many of the churches portrayed Judaism. And then I went on to become involved in um, more multi-faith work and found that other groups also had found themselves painted into a position of negativity it's very difficult you know judaism is not a missionary religion we're sometimes blamed for that and i'm not going to go into the theological reasons for it now but if you have religions that are missionary religions and they are competing for the same people um one of the ways of trying to bring people in is by being fairly unpleasant about other religions and i was absolutely determined that as much as I could, I would try to make it um, to, to build relationships between faiths so that we were not negative about each other. You don't have to believe in what other people believe, but you have to believe that what is right for them is as important to them as your faith is to you. And that means don't knock it. Other people I can't always understand other people's practice, though I try to, as much as I can, but I believe firmly that it really is the way that they practice their faith, the way that they approach spirituality is as valid for them as the way that I approach my faith and my spirituality. And given that, I can talk to anybody and I can certainly benefit from the insights that they bring in terms of their relationship with whoever it is. Um, in terms of the, the current situation that we find ourselves in, uh, being isolated and uh, self-isolating and, 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 and the lack of, uh, you know, uh, uh, going out, um, how are you finding that? And, and what are you finding is keeping you resilient and, and physically and mentally well? I think I'm lucky. I've always been a resilient and optimistic person. I remember when my husband died, which is more than 18 years ago now, a friend of mine said to me, Penny, how are you going to get through this? And I said exactly what I've just said. I've always been optimistic and resilient. And I guess that'll take me through to a, a position of being able to cope perfectly adequately. And in a way, um, actually, at the moment, I have never, I haven't been as busy as this, Monoa since I was president way back in the 90s, because there is so much to coordinate and extra things to do and making sure that uh, people are kept in contact with each other. I'm hoping, I'm sure it will slow down in the end, but uh, it'll probably slow down at the point when it's no longer needed, but never mind, it'll be there for the future and, and that's great. So uh, apart from taking time out to walk the dog in a, socially isolated a manner as I possibly can. I'm really very busy here and certainly up to the end of last week I would say I was spending about six hours either writing or on the telephone or whatsapping or zooming or whatever else it happened to be as we try to make sure things are in place to sustain the community. And I've also been really really um, touched and 
pleased that people on the street where I live, um, somebody dropped a note through my letterbox, someone who I'd met just in passing, I think we'd stood on the pavement and she'd been talking to somebody else and I was uh, sort of came along and got involved. So I've, I've only met her once in the six years that I've been here. And her family put notices through the doors. I don't know how many doors they put notices through saying, we're here, we're stuck here the same as you are. We've got uh, adolescents who can help. Please get in touch with us if you need any shopping done, if you need any prescriptions picked up. And I thought that was really the beginning of turning this street into a community. When last week, when it was uh, going out to clap for the NHS, I got in touch with as many people whose emails I had and blow me down there we all were out on the street <laughs> clapping for the nhs and i've since been approached by somebody else on the street as i walked past with the dog uh, he said to me do you want to be in a whatsapp group and i've said yes because i think it's really important oh and when i had the argument with the tree um luckily my next door neighbor was out in the garden and when i shouted help um yeah we we, we I'm sure transgressed just about every rule of social distancing, but I didn't know, I actually had a cut around my eye and I didn't know where it was and she came over and had a look at it and made me a cup of tea. So I think it's really important that we actually do get to know our neighbors. And I think that people who feel really isolated, maybe, you know, we all live in villages. Maybe our work is our village. Maybe our family is our village. If we can set up villages in the place where we live, let's call it communities, rather, we are all part of those communities. And the mm. very fact that you happen to live in the same place gives you an element of knowing how it is for the other person. And whether you live in a block of flats or you live on a, a, a widely spaced street or a narrowly spaced street, whatever it is, if you've got nothing to better to better to do, I would say write a note to everybody and say, would you like to be part of um, our community's group? And then we can all try and support each other. Because I certainly find an enormous strength from knowing that I can get in contact with people from where whichever group I happen to be belong to um, that will help me and who I can help. It's a two-way process and I'm not young anymore, and, but I can still be supportive in terms of phoning people up or trying to arrange someone else to help. And it's good to speak to your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And, and, and finally, uh, Penny, I, I suppose in such unprecedented times, what would your message be for the Oxfordshire Community Hub with those people listening to this? Go on providing a, a centre point for communicating with each other. Oxfordshire Community Hub is what it says it is. It's building its own community. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't want to go round to your neighbours, get in touch with them. Listen to what they're saying. Watch what they're putting out. Do anything to make yourself part you may be isolated physically, but you can be part of a community. And it's another part to our lives, which can be really enhancing in times of trouble. Mm. Well, Penny, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us for this, um, this interview, a conversation. Uh, you've, you've been a wonderful friend uh, over the years. Uh, you've done so much in terms of building relationships in, in the communities, multi-faith communities. You also play an instrumental part in the Oxford Council of Faith, but also the Friendship Walk. So thank you for all that you do. Keep safe, keep well, and um, and take care. Thank you, Monowa, and thank you to you too for all that you do for us. Thank you. <laughs>